Please turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 1. We are continuing our study in the book of John, and we've made it to verse 14. Before we read verses 14 through 18, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that you would show us now the love that casts out all fear, uh, that you would show us your love uh, that is found in Jesus, that you would open our eyes to see the glory of your love there in Jesus and in the cross and in the resurrection, that we would marvel and rejoice uh, at your glory and your love and your mercy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. I am enamored with the concept of glory. And as self-contradictory as it might seem, I think glory is a very mundane concept. Everything has a certain glory to it. Breakfast cereal has a certain glory. Homemade pancakes has another. Uh, There is a glory to folded laundry and a glory to a great work of art. There is a glory to an old building and a glory to a word of kindness. There is a glory to a classic piece of music and another glory to an NF song. Everything has its own glory. Paul put it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 to 41. He says, There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. Every created thing is glorious in its own way. Everything has something to offer the world, whether bugs or basketball games, beaches or birthday cake. Everything has its own glory. There are glories of sights and sounds and smells, tastes and touch. And we are hungry for glory. And of course, we were made for glory. We were made for all these things, and these things were made for us. We were made to enjoy them. We were made to delight in the garden. God himself called it good. We can call it good. Now, the problem is not that we are hungry for glory. The problem is not that we enjoy these glories. The problem comes when our hearts are set on the glories of this age. Not that we enjoy them, not that we have them, not even that we seek them out from time to time, but that we set our hearts on them. We have set our hearts on the glories of this age. But Jesus came to make known another glory, a greater glory, the original glory, the glory of God. And we see four things as we look at our passage this morning about Jesus' glory. We see the uniqueness of Jesus' glory, the effect of Jesus' glory, the place of Jesus' glory, and the fullness of Jesus' glory. First, the uniqueness of it. I am often, and maybe some of you are as well, looking for the next thing, uh, the next Netflix show, the next Marvel movie, the next iPhone game, uh, something that will capture my interest, stir my fancy, It could be a pile of clean clothes or a good book, all right? We look anywhere and everywhere. We look to whatever this world has to offer. 
We look to our jobs, our relationships, our hobbies. We look to the glory of academics and the glories of accomplishment and the glories of a quiet, ordered life. And most of these things are fine and enjoyable, but they are not soul satisfying. They do not last. They fall under the biblical category of created things, good things, but created things. But Jesus came to show us another glory. Look again at verses 14 and 15. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So the word of John 1, 1, that was with God and was God, became flesh in the person of Jesus. John and his contemporaries saw his glory. Uh, Jesus' glory is unique, and John points this out in three different ways. First, Jesus is the word, as we've been talking about already. We've seen that uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We looked at what that means. Jesus was the word who was with God and was God. He is a being unlike any other. And it is, it is the glory of this word that John saw in the person of Jesus. Second, in our text, John further explains who Jesus is when he says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And the, the word there, is, it's a Greek word that, uh, that uh, means most likely only or unique or special. Uh, Jesus is the only Son from the Father. He is uniquely related to the Father. Uh, the NASB has only begotten. The NIV has one and only. Right? The word stresses Jesus' uniqueness and that Jesus is special to the Father. In the New Testament, the word is often used of, of only children, uh, but it also refers to Isaac in Hebrews eleven seventeen. Isaac, you may remember, is not technically an only child. He had an older brother, Ishmael, but he was special to Abraham. In Genesis, God refers to Isaac as your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. This is Jesus, the unique son, beloved of his father. Uh, Verse 15, then, is sometimes seen as an interruption. Uh, In the ESV, you even see it. It puts it in parentheses. Uh, But just as verses 17 to 18 flesh out Jesus' fullness, which we will get to, uh, verse 15 fleshes out Jesus' uniqueness. Verse 15 says, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. In Jesus' day, as maybe in most days, priority and honor went to the older and the first. John the Baptist was born before Jesus. John the Baptist ministered before Jesus. Uh, John, therefore, was the, the more important of the two, or at least that's what people would think. But John said this of Jesus. He said, he who comes after me, Jesus, ranks before me. Okay, John, people would say, that's weird. Why is that? Because he was before me, John says. Jesus was before John. Jesus existed before John. How could that be? Well, again, because Jesus is the only son from the Father. Jesus is the eternal word who was with God and was God. This is how Jesus can say later in John 8, 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What does this mean for the glory of Jesus? Well, the glory of Jesus is totally unique. There is something about him that is not true of anything else in this world because the glory of Jesus is not the glory of created things. The glory of Jesus is not the glory of this world. It is the glory of the Word. The glory of Jesus is the glory of the only Son from the Father. Now, I should say uh, one thing about this word glory at this point. Uh, Maybe it's a bit confusing to you. It's a bit of an odd word. We don't normally use it every day. Uh, Often in the church, we use it in, in a verbal form, right? The Westminster Shorter Catechism uses it as a verb. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that's an important truth about glory. It's something we do. We glorify God. Our goal is to glorify him, to lift up his reputation, to marvel, to worship. But I'm using the word glory here in a related but slightly different way. I'm talking about Jesus' objective glory, all that makes him glorious, that which makes us go, wow. 
I say wow a lot. Uh, normally about things that I eat and drink, uh, sometimes about things that I hear and see. But Jesus' glory is what makes us say wow about him. It's what makes him worthy of being glorified. It's in this sense that we can contrast the glories of this age with the glory of Jesus. The glory of created things does not satisfy, cannot satisfy. We were made to enjoy creation, but not to be satisfied by it. And when our hearts drive us to created things, especially to, to a sinful overenjoyment of created things, we are believing a lie, right? That the glories of this age can satisfy our hearts. And I believe that lie more often than I'd like to admit. I'll say things to God like, I know you are the source of joy, but this thing in this moment, I really think it's going to make me happy. Don't believe the lie. Only God and his glory can satisfy the longing heart. And so here comes Jesus. Whatever else we will say about his glory, it is not the glory of created things, but the glory of God, the word made flesh. And so the uniqueness of Jesus' glory is simply that it is the glory of God. What about the effect of Jesus' glory? Uh, there, are there are different kinds of people who don't believe in God. Uh, some say that there is no God. He, he does not exist. Uh, if you ask them, how can you have such certainty to know that he does not exist? Uh, that's a strong level of certainty. Uh, some may eventually say, okay, maybe God exists, but we cannot know for sure. You've really, all you've done there is you've made an agnostic out of an atheist, right? Someone who says there is no God to someone who's saying, I don't know if there is a God, and we can't know if there is a God. But notice often the level of certainty hasn't changed. You, you cannot know whether God exists is still a strong statement. You can appreciate why people end up there, though. Uh, John says in chapter 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God. John will say later in John 5, 37, and the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard and his form you have never seen. No one has ever seen God. Now, if you can't see God and can't hear God, if you can't touch him or smell him, how can you know him? Of course, verse 18 tells us. Verse 18 says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus is here called the only God. Now, if we hadn't read the verses up to this point, it might be surprising, but it shouldn't be surprising now. He is the Word who was from the beginning, who was with God and was God. And this only God is at the Father's side, at his bosom. It's a, it's a term of intimacy. At the Last Supper in John 13, 23, we read this. One of his disciples, most likely John, the writer of the book, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at table at Jesus' side. To be at someone's side, to be at their bosom, depending on the context, is to be nestled in, to be loved, to be cared for. Jesus is the Word, the only God who is at the Father's side. And that gives Jesus a bit of an advantage, doesn't it? Uh, Jesus will say in John six forty six, not that anyone has seen the Father, except... He who is from God, he has seen the Father. If Jesus has experienced such intimacy with the Father, if he was with God and was God, then he has seen God, and he can make him known. And John says he has. That's what Jesus came to do. Now, sometimes people will say, well, we, we, we can't really know, and it's out of a sense of humility. And that makes sense, right? We should be sympathetic to that. But, but, but John says, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John says that Jesus has made God known. So how can one say with such certainty that Jesus has not made God known? Because if we can't know God, then that's what you're saying. Jesus was with God and was God because Jesus is God, to see him is to see the Father. That's what Jesus will say later in John 14, 9. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. To see the glory of Jesus is to see the glory of the Father. The Father's glory has been revealed. To say that we cannot know is, is not a statement that, oh, there's not enough evidence. It's actually a rejection of the evidence that exists. 
that which is revealed in the glory of Jesus. Now, this passage uh, in John 1 has multiple echoes of Moses' time on Mount Sinai. And we've already come to one of them here, verse 18, when it says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Uh, When Moses was on Mount Sinai, he asks to see God's glory. Exodus 33, 18, Moses said, Please show me your glory. And God responds in verse 20, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Moses caught a glimpse in that episode, a glimpse of God's goodness, but could not see the fullness of his glory. But now Jesus comes, not as a new Moses seeking God's glory, but as God himself revealing his glory, not to Moses, but to us. Jesus comes with a unique glory, the only Son of the Father, and He comes to make the Father known. He comes as God to reveal God, as the Son to reveal the Father. The uniqueness of that glory is that it's the glory of God. The effect of it is, therefore, that God is known through Jesus. If you want to know the Father, look to the Son. Now, if you respond, well, I don't believe that Jesus is who John says He is. I don't believe that Jesus is the Word incarnate. I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I would simply say, stop, slow down, and look. Jesus came to reveal. Stop and look at Jesus' glory. Don't, Don't make your assessment too hastily, just because it sounds outlandish, and it does. Wait, stop, look at Jesus. Don't make your assessment without investigating the facts. And by the facts, I mean the person of Jesus. His glory is not like any other. To look deep in the face, into the face of Jesus is to see the glory of the Father. A third, let's talk about the place of Jesus' glory. Where do you look for glory? Where is it found? Hollywood? Nashville? The White House? The battlefield? And if you want to see glorious people, you, you Google movie stars and rock stars, victors and heroes... We look to being richer and stronger and smarter and more beautiful, right? Beautiful people in our culture are considered glorious. We look to get into the spotlight or to make a name for ourselves. That's how you gain glory, or at least that's what we think. Now, up to this point, we've, we've skipped over what is really some of the most important words in the Gospel of John, perhaps in the whole Bible, and that's John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word that was with God and was God, this Word, therefore, that is uniquely glorious, this Word that reveals the Father, this Word became flesh. God became a man. Now, this word flesh is sometimes seen as negative. Sometimes Scripture seems to equate it with sin at times. But most places, it it doesn't mean that. It means something bigger. Flesh refers to everything in this present age, to what it means to be human instead of divine. Flesh refers to human weakness, therefore, in particular, and frailty and fleetingness. To take on flesh is to take on this world, to take on humanity, to take on our weakness. When we look for glory, we tend to look up. We look to those who are above us on the social ladder, to the cool kids on the playground, to the valedictorian, to those who, uh, with bigger degrees or, or with more degrees or a bigger paycheck or more followers on social media. We look up to those who have succeeded in some way in this life. But when Jesus wants us to see God's glory, he comes down. He comes down to us from heaven to earth as God become man, as creator become a creature, as Lord become a servant. When Jesus wants us to see God's glory, he humbles himself. He becomes one of us. The place of Jesus' glory is unexpected because it is the place of humility And it's the place of sympathy, right? Think about it. Jesus takes on toenails and nose hair, stomach aches and back aches and headaches and toothaches. He becomes vulnerable, vulnerable as a baby when he is born, yes, but but to become flesh is to become vulnerable. He comes to know hunger, pain, sadness, loneliness, abandonment, betrayal, injustice, oppression, suffering, and death. When you experience such things, you can know that that God knows not just because he is all-knowing, though that is true, 
But God knows because he has come and walked a mile in your shoes. God became man. The word became flesh. See, we, we look for glory in all the wrong places. We look up, but Jesus came down to the place of humility and sympathy. And he dwelt among us. Here we find another echo of Sinai. Uh, the word dwelt among us is more literally, but more awkwardly, the word tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent in our midst. As God dwelt with his people in the Old Testament in the tabernacle, so God has come to dwell with his people again in the word become flesh. Just as God was with his people of old, so God has come to be with us in the person of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, this is better than what was true in the Old Testament because God did not dwell in the tabernacle. According to Solomon, he caused his name to dwell there, but he himself dwelt in heaven. There is a fullness here and now in the person of Jesus that was only anticipated in the tabernacle. I remember what the tabernacle was for. It was for approaching God. It was for drawing near. The tabernacle was like a set of courting rituals that gave you access to the Almighty. But now the wedding is over and Jesus has moved in. God with us, the Word become flesh. The place of Jesus' glory is in the flesh. That is where the glory of God is made known. The, the glory of the Creator is seen in Him who took to Himself creation. Now, as we have said and will continue to say uh, throughout the Gospel of John, this, this might pose a problem for you because we don't see Him. We haven't seen Him in the flesh, those of us in this room. He was in the flesh in this world. He continues to be in the flesh, but His body is in heaven. He has ascended bodily to the right hand of the Father, which may even be what is intended in verse 18 when it says, He who is at the Father's side. Since Jesus' flesh is at the Father's side, we can no longer see Him, which is why the testimony of John is so important. John says in verse 14, We have seen His glory, which at least means John and his contemporaries. Which brings us to a passage in 1 John, which I, I might have quoted in every sermon so far in John. That's 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where John, in another context, says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Jesus manifested the glory of God in his flesh. And we know that today because of certain eyewitnesses, the apostles who have testified to what they saw and heard and touched in the person of Jesus. So the uniqueness of Jesus' glory is that it's the glory of God. The effect is that God is made known through him. We see the Father through the Son. The, the place of Jesus' glory is in his flesh, the place of weakness and sympathy and humility and vulnerability as God draws near to man in the person of Jesus. Finally, the fullness of Jesus' glory. You know, what is glorious to us, as we have said and implied, is things like success, the fullness of glory uh, would have been, if we had written the story for Jesus, the fullness of glory would have been Jesus coming, kicking butt, taking names. The fullness of glory would have been Jesus coming in judgment, surrounded by his angelic army, putting down his enemies, setting up his throne, and reigning from on high. That would have been impressive. That would have been glorious. And the truth is, that will happen, but not yet. And if we don't see that what Jesus did was more glorious still, we don't yet get Jesus. John 1.14, again, says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Jesus' glory is full of grace and truth. Here, here is our, our third echo of Exodus. When God appears to Moses, he proclaims his name in Exodus 34, 6. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And the Greek of full of grace and truth is an echo of the Hebrew of abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
And so to be full of grace and truth means that Jesus' glory is full of God's committed love and covenant faithfulness. John goes on to say in verse 16, And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace, uh, uh, many of the commentators say, is, is a hard phrase to translate, but it probably means something like having received grace, we receive even more grace. Grace upon grace, grace added to grace, grace and more grace, which then is most likely explained in the next verse, in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, our tendency when we read that uh, verse often is to take it as a hard contrast, Moses' law, bad, grace and truth through Jesus, good. But that would be a mistake. Uh, Moses' law is not bad. Moses is not bad. The law is not bad. In, in John, Moses points forward to Jesus. John 1.45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Or in John 5.46, Jesus says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. It's not that Moses is bad. He points forward to Jesus. And Moses brought good things. Uh, Jesus mentions a couple in John 3 and in John 6. He talks about the serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness and the manna from heaven. It's not that uh, Moses didn't bring good things. It's just that Jesus brings better things. The Son of Man will be lifted up to bring eternal life. He himself is the bread from heaven. It's not that Moses is bad, but he points forward to Jesus. It's not that Moses is bad, but that Jesus is better. We have been given not only the grace of Moses' law, John is saying, but also the grace of the word incarnate, grace upon grace. And yet as good as Moses and the law are, there is a downside. In John 7, Jesus says, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. In John 5, 45, he says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. The law has become a stumbling block. As good as it is, Israel fails to keep it. And when we fail to keep it, the law does the only thing the law can do. It condemns and accuses. What do we need? We need grace and truth. The the, the grace of law was given through Moses, and it had its own glory. We read about that earlier in 2 Corinthians 3. Paul says there, Now if the ministry of death, carved carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory." Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if, that, if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Right? There was a glory to the law of Moses. It revealed the character of the Father, and it pointed us forward to Jesus. But it is nevertheless a ministry of condemnation. Moses becomes our accuser because having the law, we don't keep the law. What do we need? We need grace and truth. Jesus is the source of grace and truth, grace upon grace. Jesus comes in weakness. He comes in the flesh, identifying with us. He bears our sin. He tastes our shame. Why? To reveal the Father. And what does he then show us about the Father? He shows us that the Father is full of grace and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness, committed kindness and covenant faithfulness. God is committed to his people. How does Jesus show that? uh, How does the Father show that? By sending his Son. Jesus comes to be forsaken so that we will never have to be. Jesus comes to bear our sin so that rather than wiping us out for our sins, Jesus could take our place, be rejected by the Father on our behalf, and we could be forgiven in him and accepted in him. God shows his commitment to us by abandoning his Son in our place for our sakes. Jesus came to fulfill the promises of the Father, to prove that those promises were not in vain. God is true to his word. God is faithful. Where is the glory of God most seen? Not in power and might, not in thunder and lightning, not in judgment and wrath. All those things are real and true. 
God is powerful. God will judge. But his glory is most fully seen in his steadfast love and faithfulness. That he is committed to his people to the end, no matter what. That he would go to great lengths for our forgiveness and for our good. Even to his own harm, to his own hurt. That's his glory. That's, of course, what we celebrate in uh, movies. Oftentimes, it starts out, the selfish, preoccupied hero finally overcomes his own ego and gives himself up for another. That's what we marvel at in people who adopt children with special needs, willingly taking on the suffering and hurt of others. That's the glory we see in the person of Jesus, who comes as the Son of the Father to bear our sin to bring us forgiveness. There's an application here that, that's not the primary application, right? The, the primary application is seeing Jesus full of grace and truth so that you see the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Father so that you worship, so that you marvel at the goodness and greatness of God. But once you've seen that, it's right to also say that as we live in such loving and sacrificial ways, people will see Jesus in us. We don't want to hinge the the success of the gospel on our success or failure as Christians. That's always a dangerous trap to fall into. But God does use us. We are Christ's body. And Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. God displays his steadfast love and faithfulness by giving his son. We make God's steadfast love and faithfulness known as we give ourselves in Jesus' name as we humble ourselves and become weak and vulnerable for the sake of others that God's love might be seen through us. As we look at the glory of Jesus, the uniqueness of Jesus' glory is that it's the glory of God, the glory of the creator, not created things. The the effect is that God is made known. The Father is seen in the Son. The place of Jesus' glory is in the flesh. God became man. The creator clothes himself in creation. The the one with all power experiences weakness and vulnerability. The one with all glory comes to no shame. The one who was righteous was even on the cross made sin for us. The content of Jesus' glory is then grace and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness, God's committed covenant kindness that he will not forsake his own even to his own harm. Have you caught a glimpse, a glimpse of the glory that is full of grace and truth? Or are you still chasing the glories of this age? They won't satisfy. But Jesus' glory will satisfy your soul and transform your life so that you too will be glorious as you reflect his glorious image in your life. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would give us a clear sight of Jesus and his glory. Open our eyes to see him, to see him in all his glory, to see the glory of the cross, his steadfast love and faithfulness shown there, that to his own harm he would come into this world to bear our sin, that we might have forgiveness in life. Help us to marvel at that, grip our hearts with that, May that stir us up. May that capture our imaginations. May that distract us from our day to day, that we would be enamored with the glory of Jesus in the cross, the glory that is full of grace and truth, full of steadfast love and faithfulness. Grip us with that glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.